I'm Ian Griffiths, sports podiatrist, and you're listening to The Physical Performance Show. And the winner is... Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to The Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome back to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by PhysioCrem and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports and exercise physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you information aimed to assist you with performing at your physical best. And we do this across a range of different episodes, including interest editions, expert editions, coaches' corners, and also featured performer episodes. And on today's episode, I bring you a recent conversation I had with Ian Griffiths, sports podiatrist, on this an expert edition. And on this expert edition, we take a deep dive into all things foot orthoses, or as many may know them, orthotics. Now, when it comes to foot orthoses, it seems that everyone has an opinion. Some people believe that everyone needs orthotics. Others believe that no one needs orthotics. Some say that orthotics or orthoses weaken the foot. Many maintain that orthoses realign or reposition the skeleton. And others believe that once you've got foot orthoses, you have them for life. These are just some of the myths that we tackle and Ian Griffiths provides accurate information around on today's episode. We discuss the history of, definition of, and mechanisms by which foot orthoses are known to have an effect. Ian shares an intriguing concept around foot orthoses as medication, and Ian lays down a fun physical challenge. By way of bio, Ian Griffiths is a foot, ankle, and lower limb specialist. Ian is the head of podiatry at the prestigious Pure Sports Medicine practice in London. In addition, Ian provides sports physiotherapy services to the PGA European Tour, England Rugby Sevens, Surrey County Cricket Club, and numerous football clubs. Ian has provided services at the 2012 London Olympic Games, and Ian maintains an active interest in research, having published work in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, the Journal of Foot and Ankle Research, and the Journal of the American Podiatric Medical Association. Ian's also a manuscript reviewer for several sports injury and physical therapy journals, and Ian speaks internationally on all things sports podiatry. Furthermore, Ian has been awarded fellowships for both the College of Podiatry in Podiatric Medicine and also the Faculty of Podiatry Medicine at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. So get ready with a pen and paper for this deep dive with Ian Griffiths on this an expert edition. Ian Griffiths, sports podiatrist. This is a real pleasure. You're professionally someone that I have esteemed since I came into contact, came in contact, I should say, with your work online. And you've certainly shaped my thinking when it comes to all things foot and lower limb sports and running related injuries and conditions. So this is a deep dive on all things foot orthoses. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thank you, Brad. And, and, and I mean this genuinely. I'm not just saying it. I'm, I'm a massive fan of this podcast. Sort of delighted and uh, surprised in equal measure to be, to be worthy enough to come on. I was literally just listening to the recent episode with uh, Dr. Stephen Seiler in my, on my long run home last night. So, yeah, I couldn't be more excited to be a guest. Well, Ian, you have so much, to sh- uh, so much wealth to share in, in what has been your career to date. Uh, so to paint a bit of a picture or give some context to listeners new to your work, what does your day-to-day see you doing and uh, why this interest, this love affair with all things the feet? Yeah. <laughs> 
I very near. I, I didn't grow up wanting to be a podiatrist. Uh, if I'm honest, I don't know. Um, I don't know if anyone does, uh, but but I certainly didn't. And uh, I very nearly moved into into becoming a pharmacist. My career and my studies were were very much putting me on on that pathway until I had a chance sort of chat one evening in a chemistry class, chemistry not a, a subject I've been a huge fan of, much more of a, a sort of physics and biology person myself. And um, and I was talking to someone and they sort of mentioned it to me and, and without going into the long drawn out version, I, I pretty much changed my career path on a sixpence and moved into into podiatry. So that's a bit of the the backstory as to as to why the love affair and uh, continues and um, yeah, day to day I, I, I divvy my week up into uh, three days clinical time so in clinic uh, in private practice in London seeing mostly sports people and uh, from from recreational through to elite and um, then a bit of consultancy with some professional clubs as well and then I'll have uh, one one to two days depending on on whether it's the school holidays or not, uh, where I'll look into uh, doing some writing, doing some reading, um, and ultimately trying to contribute to some research. I'm fortunate enough to be a, a small part of some bigger teams that have much more intelligent people than me. So I've been sort of getting my, uh, I guess, dipping my toe in the research waters and, and riding the coattails of, of, of much smarter people and uh, hope to hope to start my own PhD late this year perhaps start of 2020 and and what might that what will that PhD I should say be focused on um, so it'll be on on foot orthoses um, ultimately they are they're not the only arrow in the podiatrist quiver but I'm, I'm conscious that you know the elephant in the room is that people hear podiatrists and they think that's our our main weapon so um my interest has always been in not not necessarily whether they work but but how they work so that they're mechanisms of effect and i think it's fair to say although there's been some great research published today over the decades we still don't uh, fully have the answer to that question so i hope to do my bit in um contributing to answering that question and, and perhaps take a slightly different slant on the mechanisms of effect, which I think it's fair to say have been historically uh, very much focused around them, the mechanics, so their kinematic effects, their kinetic effect, the direct mechanical effects. And I, I quite like the idea, if, if accepted and if feasible, to, to look into some of the, the psycho or potential psychosocial mechanisms of effect of these bits of material that we place in people's shoes brilliant and let's go there today in terms of uh pulling apart the mechanisms what is known and obviously there's work to be done hence your phd uh ian and i believe fallen into podiatry uh, as you said you didn't grow up aspiring to be that initially but you did have a good encounter i believe with a podiatrist that really uh turned you uh, i guess the lights on in terms of uh, how fulfilling your career could be, which it has been to date. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that encounter? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, as anyone does, and as we always advise people to do, when you're sort of uh, when you're trying to decide uh, which university to apply to, you also need to spend some time shadowing some some other professionals. And at the time, um, I'd spent some time with a with a podiatrist, and utterly ashamed to admit that I, I, I don't know his name or whether he's still practicing. He, he may well have retired since because this was over 20 years ago, but uh, he was just incredible. He, he he was just clearly a man who loved his work. He made every single person that came into that room um, sort of part of the journey. You could see how much fun he was having. You could see he was helping people. And uh, at the time, the concept of either looking at putting labels on bottles and putting pills into bottles versus engaging with other humans on this daily level. I mean, he pretty much showed me, and he must have been 60 years old, he pretty much showed me that at 60 years old he was loving the career he'd chosen. And I think ultimately, were it not for him, or had I caught him or indeed someone else on a on a bad day, which we and we're all capable of having those, I perhaps wouldn't have left that room feeling, feeling quite so positive about it. I did spend some time with another professional of another profession prior to that, um, just as when I was testing some of the other professions along with podiatry, and I think I caught someone on a bad day. <laughs> but ultimately, I, I left there comparing those two experiences, and it, it's pretty fair to say that that individual is 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 certainly responsible or partly responsible for my decision to go into podiatry and when I have students in with me now uh, despite how bad a day I'm having or how sleep deprived I am because of, you know, of the night my children gave me the prior um, I try to remind myself that um, 
to, to be more like the person I shadowed um, and, and try and give a potential student the experience that I had. Yeah, that's so rich. I, I mean, I pursued my career in physiotherapy largely because the physiotherapist I had, I was a school student, a junior triathlete. She said to me one day, maybe she said, you'd be a great physio one day. And uh, that was it. The seed was planted. And when the professional triathlon gig didn't work out, uh, there I was. So the power of uh, the power of example and an influence. It's really, really strange to think that you are possibly shaping someone else's future. But but ultimately, and, and it seems a bit uh, over the top to, to assume you have the power to do that. But but ultimately, someone did that to me. Uh, you know, it has to be possible that I could do that to someone else. So I feel like it's, it's, it's our duty, isn't it, to try and leave the profession, uh, whatever our profession, in a, in a slightly richer state than we found it, whether that be with contribution to the published work or, or whether that be with nurturing the next generation. So it's all, I think it's all part of the same, um, uh, I think the same goal. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's that brilliant saying, uh, I don't know who to credit, credit it to, but uh, you're only one handshake away from your destiny. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Ian, foot orthoses, a definition. Uh, you know, people refer to them as different things, inserts, orthotics, uh, foot orthoses. What are they? What's the definition? And, uh, you know, according to you, the expert. It's a good question. And I think there's two questions there, that I, or two questions I heard when you said that. And the first is, what's the definition? And the second is, what's the right terminology or, or nomenclature, which we'll, 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 we'll attack that second. Um, Definition-wise, it's it's, um, it's difficult because you go onto the internet, you go onto Google and you, you, you put it in, you'll see real variations upon a theme. And some will talk about something that anything that goes in the shoe is, is an orthosis. Uh, others will talk about that it has to generate some kind of functional change. There's a bit of debate about what, what on earth does functional change mean. I, I immediately think to a, a patient I saw recently who was not a, a medical professional. He was, he, was, uh, he was an engineer. So he's, he's obviously got, a, got that sort of mind, uh, that mindset, that, that way of looking at things uh, and breaking them down to their component parts. But he'd developed some um, what, what turned out to be perineal uh, sensitivity off of the back of running on a, on a camber for a long time on one of his long runs. And um, bear in mind, he's not a medical professional. He doesn't, he's never even heard of what the perineal tendons are. All he knows is he's sensitive down the lateral aspect of his lower leg and into his, into his ankle. And whether it be trial and error or whether it be his engineering mind, when he came in to see me, he said, I don't want you to, to laugh at me, but I've, I've found something that works. He said, I don't want to be that guy but I, but I played around with it a bit I found something that really helped my pain and I've put it in my shoe and I said okay let, let's take a look and um, he'd essentially taken bits of A4 paper scrunched them up into balls and arranged a row of them underneath the sock liner of his trainer down the lateral border of his foot so esen- essentially given himself a full length uh, a full length valgus wedge <laughs> which mechanically speaking is is utterly the right thing to do to offload the perineum um, and I, I, I sort of told him and I could see the pride in his face when he, he realized how right he'd got it but I mean a very reasonable question is is that an orthosis um, because it's something in the shoe it has generated change, mechanical change and symptom change. So um, we try not to get too bogged down on, on defining these things, but ultimately, um, if we really wanted to, we could call scrunched up bits of paper orthoses. The second part of the question is, is where I, I look like a, a real picky individual, a bit of a pedant, and I, and I am both of those things for sure. <laughs> but um, the most the most commonly used term is, is, is orthotics. I think that that's the term that patients use the most. It's the term that you you see in the magazines the most and, and professionals and orthotics not a not a phrase i i'm a huge fan of um with the reason being that orthotics is essentially the entire it's the entire profession that governs the issue of orthoses and we should state at this point that we're talking about foot orthoses but orthoses can be applied to any part of the body as, as i'm sure you know you know you know the wrist the neck etc uh, you know knee braces they all come under the umbrella term orthoses so when we're talking about foot orthoses they are one of many orthoses and the provision of all of these devices is under the umbrella of, of orthotics. And um, to, to lean on my pharmacy days, and a lot of my analogies are pharmacy-based, and I don't know whether that's because of uh, my, my prior history, but ultimately, you know, what we have is, is, is pharmacy uh, that, that, or pharmacology that, that governs the, the provision or the issue of drugs. So let's take 
enalapril, you know, the, the ACE inhibitor given for uh, hypertension, high blood pressure. If you go to the chemist and they, they order the doctor and they prescribe you some enalapril, they've given you an ACE inhibitor. They haven't given you pharmacy. So if someone puts something in your shoe, they've given you foot orthoses. They haven't given you orthotics. Uh, does that analogy make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I think it's nicest to have some consensus on uh, on the terminology that we use. So that's that's great. Thanks for setting the scene there, Ian. In terms of uh, orthotics, it seems that – sorry, orthoses. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry. I'm not going to call you on it. Don't worry. In terms of orth- foot orthoses – uh, it seems that everyone has an opinion. You know, things that you can negatively hear are they don't work, they're a con, a waste of money, they don't address the cause of the problem. You know, uh, the runner in the sport in the running club said that I needed them through to they are the saving grace. That's what fixed my plantar fasciitis. Um, so let's let's debunk a few of the myths Ian um, before we then dive into how they the effects or the mechanisms by which they may work so uh, what are some of the myths that we need to get out of the uh, out of the way to start yeah it, it's such a such a good place to start such a sensible place to start and your comment could not be more true that everyone has an opinion on them um, as, as as people have opinions on a, a lot of things nowadays and rather than opinions maybe we should frame them as beliefs. People come into clinic with beliefs, uh, whether it be positive or negative. And, and just like our beliefs with any anything, really, any, any intervention or otherwise, our beliefs come from uh, the people we surround ourselves with, uh, the information that we, uh, we, we actively try to look for, the information that is served up to us based on, on um, you know, again, where we, the, the source of our information and also our previous experiences. Uh, so I think when you take a group of, uh, although runners aren't the only group of people that, that these things are applied to, you know, let's use them as an example. You take a group of runners and you're hard pressed to find someone that doesn't have a belief for that reason, direct experience they've had, positive or negative, or, or the, the colleagues around the club, the magazines they read. And, and I think when we look at the myths, there are numerous, but we'll, we'll lay out what we would consider, I guess, the top the top five or so. Um, everyone at some point will have either held one of these beliefs or currently holds this belief, or, or at the very least, I think they'd have heard of them. And I think it's important to know the myths. It's important to know some of the reasoning behind why people have these beliefs as well. Because if someone comes into clinic, you've got to ask them. I think one of the first things I ask people about orthoses, whether they've had them before or not, is, is try to... to tease out what some of their experience with experiences with them are and also what their beliefs with them are because that is very much going to f- sort of color how the rest of the discussion goes based on what i think might might be necessary so in, in no particular order uh, you've uh, you've probably touched on a couple of them for me the big the big myths number one or number one and number two are kind of the same myth but they're they're, they're opposites the first myth being everyone needs them or the second myth being no one needs them I guess you could bunch those into one group, uh, one, one myth, which is this dichotomous belief that that they are they can only be good or only be evil. You know, they they uh, they can't be something in the middle. Moving on to the next big one, which I think ultimately underpins everything, and we'll surely come on to this when we talk about mechanisms. But this myth or this belief that they they realign the skeleton. Uh, or to use other parlance, they correct you, or they fix you, or they, they, you know, they, they, they change, you know, they, they improve your alignment or your biomechanics, um, etc. And I think that is pretty much underpinning almost every every person's belief system when they when they subscribe to these myths. And then I guess the two sub myths off the back of that, and they can all be fed back to it, is that they weaken feet, uh, they brace the foot, they're, they're like a brace, and thus. They, they weaken the foot. And and then finally, the one I hear probably daily from runners is and running stores is that they can only go in a neutral running shoe. They 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 mustn't go in any shoe of any other kind. You know, the, the, the orthosis does all of the air quotes correction and thus the shoe needs to be, a, a, you know, a blank canvas. I think for me, they're the big five that I am having discussions about almost daily for the last 
19, 20 years. And should we throw in there the life sentence uh, myth that I have heard you reference before, <laughs> which is that, you know, until death do us part, there's your foot orthoses. Yes, we, we should, absolutely. Um, and as we'll probably come on to say, I think if you can if you can paint the picture for someone that these things aren't correcting an abnormality, uh, so to speak, they're not realigning the skeleton. If you can jump that one hurdle, it's very quick that the other myths start to crumble um, because most of them are built upon that myth. And I think if you truly believe that you are ill-equipped to run without these devices, if you, your, your, your alignment, your mechanics are so awful because you've been told they are, that, that you cannot run pain-free without these devices. And when you're wearing them, they're corrective. Like, just like the spectacles that you wear improve your vision. It stands to reason that it's, it's fairly obvious to us why someone would thus assume these things are a life sentence. I've said this before, but I mean, you, you, you get given a pair of glasses by the optician and, and without any anything being mentioned or spoken of, the, the, un, the unspoken assumption is I'm going to be wearing these till, till I'm in my grave. I'm probably going to be wearing them in my grave. You know, these glasses are part of my life. I'm a glasses wearer now. Yet, if you injure your, your shoulder or your elbow and you go to see the orthopedic specialist or the physiotherapist and they say, right, we, we're going to try and desensitize things here for a period of time. Let's, let's, let's pop, pop on a, a, you know, a, a sling over the elbow or the shoulder. Um, Without any word being spoken, no one, and I mean no one, thinks, oh, no, I'm a sling wearer for the rest of my life now. The, the, comment, the comment would then be, so what are we talking, three weeks, four weeks? You, you know it's coming off. You know it's a part of a rehab strategy um, with, a, with, a, with an evolution to it. I think if you can start getting, if you can reframe these devices to people, both in what they are, what they do, what they don't do, it's very quick to see the penny drop. To my mind, people will, in the majority of cases, require them to be more like a sling than they will a pair of uh, eyeglasses. That's fantastic. More like a sling rather than a pair of eyeglasses. And as you say, if you can reframe what they do, foot orthoses, what they are, what they do, what they don't do, then a lot of the other myths become sort of redundant. So, let me ask you this, Ian. Why is it that so many people, most runners on the street, I think if you polled them, uh, most athletes, if you said, what do foot orthoses do? Why is it that the assumption is that they are skeleton aligners or correcting your, your position and changing mechanics? Where has that come from? I mean, it's interesting because we, we look at research and we know that over time it, it evolves and it changes, and that, that's the that's what we know as the process of science, isn't it? But even no matter no matter how far back you go, it's almost impossible to find research that supports that contention. All of the kinematic studies that have been published for decades, they're in disagreement. Some of them show kinematic change at the rear foot, and some of them show um, you know minimal kinematic change. The the general take home now is that your kinematic response to them. Uh, will be subject specific, unpredictable, and not necessarily relate or correlate well with symptom change anyway. But when you look at all of this research, you say, okay, it doesn't matter how far back we go. There was never a time that research supported the contention that these things will hold you in subtalar neutral or pop your calcanium back to vertical. I'm making reference to the, the classic before and after picture that I know you've seen, that everyone's seen, that, you know, that foot standing on its own in a very pronated position and then the foot sitting on top of the, the orthosis in a very straight and vertical position. And, and ultimately that picture, I, mean, I don't want to lay blame at the, you know, in, at the door of one picture, but it's, you know, I've got a colleague who refers to it as the, the picture that sells a million orthoses, you know, um, because it's a very powerful image. It's, it's the before and after image that, that today's society like. It's the, it's the Weight Watchers image of the person standing in the old pair of trousers that, that, that used to fit them, but now there's, there's room for another person in there as well. And um, I promise you no one would love that mechanism of effect of orthoses to be true more than podiatrists. I just can't tell you how easy it would make our daily practice, how easy it would make these things with regard to discussing them with patients, with regard to setting expectations of outcomes, with regard to writing prescriptions. No one wishes it were more true than, than me and my colleagues. So science does not support it now, and it doesn't matter how far, you, how far you go back, it's never supported it. We have to assume it's gained momentum, popularity, and, and continues to, to be the, the mainstream of, of, of popular belief 
purely because of one of two things, simplicity and marketing. And I think you put simplicity and marketing together and you've got a pretty powerful juggernaut that no scientists or clinicians in the world have, have in isolation, have the ability to, to fight against. And do you mean, Ian, marketing from the industry, the podiatry industry of that classic image? I know even... Uh you know, where, I, where I'm recording this from uh, with you on the Gold Coast in Australia, there would be uh, at least once a month a uh, back page of the main paper, that Bigfoot image from a podiatry, uh, podiatry company, you know, do this to this, uh, crosses and ticks on someone's skeleton being realigned. So is that what you mean by marketing? Absolutely. I, I certainly don't want to blame just podiatry, although, yeah. you know, we're, we're guilty of it, of course. But um, uh, orthosis companies, uh, you know, the companies that sell prefabs, um, it makes complete sense as a business model. I mean, like you say, uh, red crosses are bad and green ticks are good, as we all know, as we all well know. Uh, and the human, the human, the, the complexity that is the human in pain um, can never be broken down to red crosses and, and green ticks. But um, the reality is, if you if you try and market the truth, if you try and market what we know about humans and about pain and about mechanics. And, and about the human foot and subject specific responses, what you have is a horribly gray, very difficult to market product. When I say marketing, I mean, yes, I, I point the finger at any clinician of any of any background that uses the before and after because it's simple. Not good enough. It doesn't matter whether it's simple. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's something your patients understand. I'd rather they didn't understand something that was false, if I'm honest. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's all clinicians. It's all companies. Basically, there is no, there is just no place in 2019 for that before and after image. Got it. And uh, you said something so profound there. I just didn't want to skip over it. The human in pain. You can never reduce them down to red crosses and green ticks, uh, which I just thought was absolutely brilliant. And we are still on debunking these myths. So we acknowledge that foot orthoses are not realigners of the skeleton. Uh, that debunks the fact that everyone or no one needs them, the myth of, of the, the second myth, if you like. The weak in the foot myth, that foot orthoses brace the foot and therefore they make the, the foot musculature weak. Can you please debunk that one? And yes, of course, of course. I mean, ultimately, it's very, very simple to to illustrate to someone that orthoses don't brace the foot. I mean, you think of a brace and, and, and you think of a neck brace. You think of one of those things that, that are put on after a road traffic accident where it's just impossible to, to move that body segment. And, you know, it, it's a true immobilization. And um, yeah, anyone that wears orthoses will tell you, you can, you can move your foot on top of the device. Make no mistake about it. They, they do not brace feet. Bracing is a very poor analogy. When we look at the subject-specific data, we also know that there are some people that have been given anti-pronation devices, so a, an insert that has been designed to reduce or, or, or decrease their pronation magnitude or pronation velocity. There are some individuals that pronate more on anti-pronation devices. So, I mean, we'll probably get stuck into that when we talk about kinematic and kinetic uh, mechanisms, but not only do these things not brace the feet, but actually people respond to them on a very individual level. To sort of debunk that they're a brace is very quick and simple. What people take more convincing of is that is that they won't weaken feet. And what I should say is I, I understand why, why that may be a position someone would adopt. It kind of makes sense to me if someone believes that when I'm walking barefoot, oh, I can feel my muscles working more. And when I put myself in a, in a, in a scenario where there's external supports provided, uh, if indeed we should call an orthosis a support, but that's a different comment, um, I can see why people would adopt the position, well, this must be providing some of the support for my foot, there, thus my muscles are not working as, as well. I, I sort of get why people um, have that belief. But as intuitive as it may feel, as intuitive as it may sound, we need to look to the science. We need to look to the data, the published work. And we are just nowhere near a position where the the, the, the sort of body of work that's been looked at here supports the contention that orthoses weaken feet. There's only four or five papers, to my knowledge, that have been published in this area. I don't know why not more, but clearly it's not it's not sexy enough to get funding, perhaps. But um, two or three of them, for, off the top of my head, actually, uh, not only not only do they not show that orthoses don't weaken feet, I believe one of them actually showed that the foot muscles got a bit stronger. Um, I right now, or, or literally yesterday and the day before, there's a 
the Footwear Biomechanics Conference is currently going on um, in Canada. And I've unfortunately not been there, but I've been keeping up to date with it on, on social media. And one of the abstracts there, um, I, I read a, a conclusion from it, and it was that, that foot orthosis did not weaken feet. So that hopefully that one will see the light of day shortly as well. So, I mean, as intuitive as it feels that they might weaken your feet, we do not have published data that supports it, no matter how much you want it to be true no matter what you know and i, I don't have a, a dog in the fight you know i don't have a badger in the bag on this one i you know i can see why if you if you have shares in in a company that sells orthoses you may well very much want want this to, to 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 not be true i can see why if you have shares in a company that that sells some kind of barefoot shoe oxymoron that that is i can see why you'd want this to be true but there's no there's no there's no badger in my bag. And, and ultimately, I look to the science. The science does not support that they weaken feet. Knowing the, the data we have from the mechanical research, it does not show that they brace feet. Yeah, I often hear from people, oh, well, my foot muscles get lazy now because something's doing the job of them, doing the job for them uh, instead. So I think that's a bit of a, a perception. And just before we move off myths, they should only go in the neutral running shoe. I know you briefly touched on it, but... Do you mean to say, Ian, that these things can go in uh, a maximalist shoe or a minimalist shoe or a traditional motion control shoe? Or can you explain that a little bit more? Why is it that they don't just live in the neutral shoes? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you're subscribing to the belief that they are realigning you, correcting you, to use the, the terminology we've been using thus far, um, it would again would make sense that you'd say, right, neutral shoe, and then the device does all, all the work for us. Um once we move away from our opinion that these things are, are realigning us or correcting us and we move on to what they're actually doing, which, I don't think, which I'm sure we're going to come on to as well, um, we can suddenly realize that what we're trying to do is man manipulate or modify what we refer to as the foot level environment. So that is not just the orthosis, but that's the shoe as well. Because you've got to remember, you cannot wear an orthosis without a shoe. So you're always going to be feeling the effects of both of them together. When do you ever truly get the mechanical effects of an, orth of, of an orthosis on its own? And the answer is never. It's always, it's got to be inside a shoe. You can't sellotape these things to people's feet. So um, you're always getting a, that, that sort of net effect of shoe plus device. And you could add a layer of complexity and also talk about the surface you're on as well, but we won't go there just for now. Um, so the answer here is what are we trying to achieve you know, with, with our intervention, with our manipulation of the foot level environment, and how do we best achieve that? And that may be with shoe X and orthosis Y. And then if we change to shoe A, orthosis Y may not be appropriate. But the point being, you can put orthoses in stability shoes, no problem. You can put orthoses in neutral shoes, in maximalist shoes, in minimalist shoes if you want. But you need to appreciate that the combination of any given orthosis and any given shoe is going to give you a different dose. And, and again, we're, we're, we're leaking into my pharmacology analogies here, but um, like, like we always say, if we think of orthosis like a drug, and I know you, you and I, you know, you know this is one of my things that I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. Um, you may need to manipulate, you know, when you, when you give someone a certain drug, depending on what other drugs they're on, you might need to take those other drugs into account because there may be contraindications or you may have to adjust things. I always say to people, think of, of what you're putting on your feet, the shoe, as giving you a certain, you know, manipulating the dose of, of load. The orthosis has the ability to do that as well. When you combine the two, there's going to be a net dose as well. So there are no simple answers. There never have been and there never will be. So it's never about the perfect shoe. It's never about the perfect device. Um, and it's certainly not about one device only going into one shoe. I remember having a discussion with someone once who was in a running store, and they said, this person's got uh, orthoses that are posted six degrees varus, and therefore they can't go into a stability shoe. And I sort of said, let's talk this out. Why can't they go into a stability shoe? Well, because the stability shoe also provides some anti-pronation. So if they've got that and they've got the orthoses, they're going to become overcorrected. Whatever you know. And I was like, well, firstly, that that's not a thing because I don't think we're correcting someone. So if you can't, we're not correcting someone. I don't think you can overcorrect them. Um, but but ultimately, 
when we look at this, we, we a, a very reasonable comment could be anti-pronation shoe, various posted orthoses. We are definitely increasing supination moments. So maybe we are increasing risk of ankle sprain. I think that's a mechanically plausible thing. But that isn't the same thing as saying these devices can't go in a stability shoe. I, what we also forget is we argue over four degrees, five degrees, six degrees of, of various post, um, like someone's running out there in the real world on a completely flat surface all the time. And as soon as someone goes onto the camera of a road, um, things change again. So I, I guess what I'm saying here, to summarise my ramblings, is that it's, I don't have all the answers. I don't think anyone does. But what I do know is it's definitely not as simple as orthoses only being able to go into one shoe. It depends what you're trying to achieve. And as always, there are probably multiple ways of, of, of achieving it. And the standout comment to me there, Ian, was it's the net effect of the shoe plus the device. So it's not one or the other. It's a combination. And it's, you know, there might be a thousand permutations of what could dose someone up to get the, you know, the desired outcome so well done myth buster ian griffiths uh there's a few great myths busted there uh and yes i have written down drugs and ian that is part of the conversation <laughs> but before we do that one uh pronation uh this is a term that you know is i really don't know a runner on the planet that hasn't at one point used that word the p word uh for that matter any athlete so pronation uh how did it become so demonized and what is it and does it matter? Uh, take us through this P word. Yeah, the P word. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I've I've been around for, as I say, 19, 20 years doing this and and it predates me but by, by a long way. This, this uh, like you say, the, the demonization of, of, of this is, is, is really interesting to me and I, I, I'm not, if I'm completely honest, I'm not sure – how far back it goes, nor nor when it began, but it certainly predates me. It's been it's been something I've been aware of my entire career, and probably something at various times you believe yourself as well. I think I think that's fair to say as as a, as a clinician. Um, I've actually stopped using the term in clinic now. I have I've had some students sitting through with me recently, and actually one of them even commented and sort of said, "You've." You've been with, you know, we've been. I've been here four hours. You've seen four, four, four new patients. You've not, you've not said pronation once, um, and, and that's pretty intentional on, on my part because it's sort of, it is a word that they attach uh, unnecessary levels of value to, and um, I don't want to, I don't want to encourage that. I don't want them to double down on that. So I tend to talk more in terms of rotation personally. I tend to talk more in terms of movement and and remind ourselves at this point that that's all pronation is and all it ever has been it's never been uh, anything more than movement you know pronation supination flexion extension they're movements all humans uh, have the ability or most humans have the ability to perform and i just don't understand why we demonize one of them i, I do not hear of extension flexion being demonized to anywhere near the same volume. I mean, of course there are scenarios where you may be sensitive into these movements and it would make sense to, uh, to minimize kind of um, minimize it at a given time. But the, the way that pronation, someone took the ball and ran with it and pronation became something more than movement. It became a diagnosis. Um, it became, you know, I'm a pronator. I mean, what on earth does that mean? When has a runner ever presented themselves to you and defined themselves as an extensor I mean, it just doesn't happen and um, i don't understand why and, and when you say to them when you when you scratch the surface and say talk me through that why, why do you believe you're firstly yes you are a pronator welcome to 99 percent of the population minus the the sort of surgically fused or the very rare congenital disorder so, so yes you are definitely agree but tell me why you think you are what what's the story behind that belief oh you know and it can be someone at the running club told them or someone at the running store told them one guy, he was told 20 years prior by someone at the running club that he was a pronator, and it was almost like it had been tattooed on him. You know, it, it, it defined him. It was his label as a runner. Mm. I'm a pronator. I'm a supernator. Not terms I like. Not terms I encourage. So I, I don't know why, 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 if I'm honest. I, it's probably, again, it, to, to be, I guess, um, 
to be possibly wrong in saying so, but it's probably down at, you know, laid at the, at the doorstep of simplicity and mm. marketing. I think those two uh, account for a lot in the running in the running industry, the running world. Um, although I could be wrong on that, of course. That, that's my read between the lines as well. It's 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 such a big area, as you say. It's not black and white. It's grey and. We like frameworks. We like to be categorise things, to put things in boxes, and uh, and I think uh, I remember as a teenage triathlete, you know, being told I was an overpronator, and then not long after that, my physiotherapist at the time, who was very very good, great clinician, but she labelled me as a runner with tibial torsion and bowed legs, geno verum. Um, uh, child bearing hips plus an overpronator, and I thought I was doomed. <laughs> child bearing hips at sixteen years of age, a male aspiring uh, junior triathlete. I thought, all right, well, maybe this won't work out so well. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting the labels that you carry with yourself. And it wasn't until years later when I, you know, was running into my twenties, and I'm like, all those things they don't seem to be bothering me, and uh, I observe them in most people. Uh, and in fact, I observe some of those mechanical traits in some of the best runners in the world yeah i i i've definitely i'm not going to pretend i haven't been guilty of of people coming to see me and and me fresh from my fresh from my undergraduate training desperate to you know coming from a completely good place trying to help the person sitting in front of me but saying right you're an injured runner let me look at you like a like a machine let me look at you like a car let me pop the bonnet here and let me see what's going on oh yeah okay we've got a bit of a leg length difference okay there's an external tibial torsion or we've got a bit of limitation in the sagittal plane at the at the ankle um oh yeah we we, we probably pronate too quickly or for too long through mid starts and actually this is a runner that's come in with patellofemoral pain they've come in with one problem and in my in my enthusiasm and my zest to help them they've left with five problems and and no, knowing what we now know about language and nocebo and and, and, and indeed pain um it makes you cringe about you sending someone away with more problems than they came in with, but also probably setting them up for a, albeit potentially short term, but maybe even long term, um, sense of fragility, sense of hypervigilance, sense of not feeling adaptable and resilient and robust, which is the way I try to make athletes that I see now leave the room feeling. Um, so, uh, I think it comes from a good place, uh, as, as you know. I, I've definitely done this in, in in my my early years, but now when I'm speaking to students, I, I I try to say to them like, you know, in your in your quest to help, in your quest to to show that that you're 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 sort of applying all of your years of experience and knowledge, just be mindful that this is a human being and not a machine. Mm, just be mindful this is a human being and not a machine. I love that. You're listening to Ian Griffiths, sports podiatrist, foot, ankle and lower limb specialist on this a deep dive into all things foot orthoses, the facts and the fallacies. Support for today's show comes from Physiocrem. Physiocrem is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients, ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that Physiocrem does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates, and its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. Physiocrem can be found Australia-wide at your local Coles, chemist or health store, as well as their online shop. Physiocrem have offered listeners of the Physical Performance Show 20% off any products available online. Simply use the coupon code POGO, P-O-G-O, when you shop at physiocrem.com.au. Hurting sucks and Physiocrem have got your back. Support for today's show also comes from POGO Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to complete their rehabilitation, get back to their physical best, and in doing so, cross their physio finish line. We offer an award-winning array of services, including our popular telehealth services. Telehealth consultations allow you, the listener, to get injury advice and assistance irrespective of where you are in the world. If you'd like to find out more about our telehealth services or schedule your one-hour initial appointment, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now, let's jump back 
with Ian Griffiths on this an expert edition around all things foot orthoses, facts and fallacies. So Ian, we have discussed the P word and let's talk about your term, the mechanisms by which foot orthoses may work. We've debunked the myth that they're skeleton correctors, that they correct position. So how do orthoses potentially work or have an effect is probably a better term. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's a, good, it's, it's a good distinction because we can mean different things by work, can't mm. we? Um, but ultimately, I think, and, and let's go there straight away. Ultimately, if someone comes to you um, with an area of, of, of sensitivity and you put something in their shoe and, and that, that area of sensitivity immediately changes, like our, like our engineer with his A4 paper in, in, in his trainer, um, that has worked. That has worked by by his definition of working, which is I had a, an area of sensitivity, I put something in place, and, and it's reduced. Um, the question is, how has that worked? And I think that's a much, much more interesting question. At least I find it interesting. Um, we can kind of artificially separate some of these proposed mechanisms because the, re- the reality is you, you probably shouldn't and probably can't separate them in, re- you know, in, in the real world. A bit like when you're talking about the biopsychosocial model, or when you're talking about pain, you talk about these things individually, but 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 it's an artificial separation because they they all occur, you know, concurrently. We're greater than the sum of our parts, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So I'm talking about them individually, but but I don't want the message here to be that that it's one or the other. But the 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 general sub areas that people have, have discussed is the kinematic effects, so their ability to to change alignment, to change angles, the kinetic effects, their ability to change forces and tissue stresses and joint moments. Uh, they're the things we can't see, of course. Um, and then we've got the the neuromotor effects. So the the non they're not direct mechanical effects, but they are. Uh, said to be effects that are centrally driven, so driven by the nerve. The central nervous system elicits a change in response to something being placed underneath it. And then I guess we've got that fourth category of the psychosocial effects, which uh, which is a, a, I'm hoping to contribute to myself, and it's very much in its in its infancy. And I mentioned them in that order because I mean I guess if you went back in time, you would have found the majority of the research would have looked at the kinematics the changes in alignment, not just because that was the prevailing belief, but actually it's fair to say it's no research is easy. And I wouldn't want to say that, you know, do, do, do research as a disservice, but it's probably the easiest of, the, of those, all of those, because you basically measure something, you take a, you know, measure something with a bit of kit, you put something in place and you measure it again. Um, uh, a horrible simplification there of that, but but ultimately a lot of the research historically would have looked at the kinematic effects, and as we've already said, none of it supports the contention that they realign the skeleton, they hold you in subtalar joint neutral, that your calcaneus is vertical throughout throughout stance phase. We've already said as well that that subject specific responses, so kinematic changes, will be. Uh, unpredictable, inconsistent, and different person to person, obviously. Um, And certainly the last systematic review that I read um, talked about how uh, when kinematic change does occur, uh, on average it occurs to the tune of about three degrees. That was a paper published in the BJSM. So then the question arises, is that significant? Not statistically significant, is it clinically significant? So I think it's reasonable to say that when it comes to these things working by changing alignment, they might do, they might not do. They uh, are going to do different things in different people. If they do change alignment, they often at the rear foot, they often do so to a very small degree. When we look at the kinetic effects, so their ability to change forces and joint moments and tissue stresses, um, and this is much more difficult to do because you're now measuring things you can't see, um, you normally need a pretty nice bit of lab kit. You normally need a good working knowledge of inverse dynamics. I, I don't have that myself. I should, I should clarify. Um, but when you look at the kinetic um, sort of research, it's, it's, it's a bit more promising. I think what you, what you notice is that although still subject specific, like any intervention, um, you generally tend to see that whenever you put something inside someone's shoe, whatever it's uh, – uh, sort of morphology, its shape, whatever its its material. Whenever you put something inside a shoe, you will you will have a kinetic change of some description. And certainly, the the 
to summarise or to give you my interpretation of the literature at this time, if we were going to say kinematics versus kinetics, not that we should compare them in that way, I think there's more support that orthoses work by modifying tissue stress, by modifying load, than there is by supporting or realigning the skeleton. And that's why we've always talked about phrasing these things or, or, or reframing these things as load modifiers rather than arch supports. The neuromotor effects, um, again, need some attention because for too long we have uh, modelled the human foot as this triangle attached to the end of the leg that is a slave to mechanical principles and, and, and mechanical laws. Um, and we've possibly done so at the at the peril of ignoring it's attached to a human being with a functioning nervous system. Um, and the reality is when we see someone pronate more on an anti-pronation device, it is next to impossible to explain that with mechanical principles. It, it, it to my mind, has to be the centrally nervous system driven. It has to be the neuromotor effect. Um, Ultimately, when we get into the psychosocial, we, we, we probably don't have enough, um, we don't have enough uh, published data to talk about that yet. But I've certainly got some, some thoughts and some ideas about possible mechanisms there. But the reality is we are, we are seeing a human being in pain who brings with them experiences and beliefs. We've already uh, sort of touched on the fact that humans, you know, exist within a biopsychosocial uh, you know, uh, world. Pain is, I think, I think my, my understanding is that pain is, is reasonably well accepted as being a biopsychosocial experience. Um, so my question here would be why when we put something in the shoe of a human in pain, are we only making an assumption that is working within the realm of bio? When, when we know we can't separate the bio, the psycho, the social with humans, we know we can't separate it with pain. And my question is, are we right to think we can separate it with the potential mechanisms of effect with a curved bit of plastic that we put in someone's shoe? When I graduated, I recall going to, I would traipse around to any bit of professional development. This was circa 2006, seven, and online wasn't as prolific as it is now in terms of developing yourself professionally. But I remember going to a Thomas McPoyle or McFoyle uh, PD event and uh, in Brisbane and at that point, he was talking about muscle activation patterns changing with foot orthoses from memory. Uh, and so I guess that's some of this. Uh, is this, that Would you deem that as neuromotor, Ian, or is that more kinetics? Or? Yeah, it's a, good, and, and to, it's a good question. Tom McPoyle, um, a great guy, and certainly hugely influenced the podiatry world. One of the, one of the earlier sort of um, voices that was talking about moving towards a tissue stress model. So, you know, when you see someone and you're trying to put something in their shoe, stop thinking about their abnormalities and how you're trying to correct them and start thinking about the target tissue and uh, what, what stress is being placed upon it you believe may be contributing to their issue and how what you're putting in their shoe and designing for their shoe is going to modify the stresses on, on, that, on that target tissue. Um, I think when you're looking at things like EMG, muscle activation and stuff, uh, I guess that would pro – I mean, does it come under kinematics or kinetics? I guess you, you could argue it comes under under both – under the umbrella of the direct mechanical effects. You could argue that if you're getting different muscle activation, it's uh, it's centrally nervous system driven. So I don't have a good answer to that. Probably, uh, probably testament to the fact that we shouldn't be talking about these uh, separately, I guess. Um you know, the, the, the kinematic, the kinetic, the neuromotor, because they're not happening separately. Um, the one thing that's just come into my mind that I, I, I meant to say and I, I should say for, for clarity is um, something that I, I guess students will always say to me when, when we have this chat and when I've said to them, look, think about these devices as, as something that has the ability to modify load, that has the ability to change load on, on tissues and not just decrease load, they can increase load as well, of course, depending on how they're designed. But Think of them as something that can change load or stress, whether it be tensile or compressive, on a tissue, and they don't necessarily have to change alignment to do that. They, 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 they can very much change. You can change kinetic parameters without changing kinematics. And, and the majority of the time with, with a new student, with an undergrad, I'll get a puzzled look, a head scratch, maybe even one of those 45-degree head tilts, like when, the, the, you know, when you're looked at quizzically, and, and they'll say, hang on a minute, like, how on earth can we change the stress in a tissue 
without changing foot posture. So I just want to take the opportunity to, to offer up an, an analogy which is far too far too good to be my own, it, and I'm not going to try and pass it off as my own. It's um, it's that of my, my good friend and my, my mentor, Dr. Simon Spooner, and he talks about children on a seesaw. Um, so if you imagine you go to the park and there's a seesaw and, and just visualize that you've got, <clears throat> excuse me, three children all sitting on one end of the seesaw. So that seesaw is very much, you know, tilted with the empty end up in the air and the end that they're all sitting on completely touching the ground. Um, so it's in a state of rotational equilibrium, i.e. it is not moving. Um, if we were to measure some kind of metric, whether it be, uh, let's, let's say we slid some kind of uh, measurement device beneath the bottom of the seesaw and the ground at the ed end that the children were sitting, we could probably quantify the, the magnitude of compression between the seesaw and the ground. And, and let's, let's call that X. If shortly after doing so, two children get called for dinner and they jump off the seesaw and they, they, run, they run home, what we'll see is an immediate change in that, that measurement that we've just take, taken, an immediate change in compressive load. So a reduction in a kinetic uh, ver uh, parameter. But what we will not see is any accompanying change in the position of the seesaw. It is still in exactly the same kinematic position. There's been no visual, measurable, observable, angular change of the seesaw. Uh, and and we, could, we could milk that analogy as much as we wanted with different scenarios and different children of different weights sitting at the end of the seesaw or closer to the middle, moving around. But ultimately, what we're doing when we take any joint axis of rotation um, is we're saying, OK, where are the children sitting? Where are the stresses in the system? How can we manipulate the stresses in that system by moving the children around? And, and in this scenario, I would say, think of the pivot of the seesaw like the subtalar joint axis. Think of the, the bottom of the seesaw and the ground as the sinus tarsi. And what you've got is a pretty reasonable working model for some kind of osseous compression in the sinus tarsi, which you can very quickly manipulate someone's symptoms of by putting something in the shoe, i.e. the orthosis is the movement of children, your orthosis reaction force is your repositioning of the children, and you can pretty quickly change symptoms uh, in, in without without any change in, uh, accompanying change in foot posture. The orthosis is the movement of the children. I think that's a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a terrible quote to take out of context, but yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's uh, that's great. Thank you for taking us taking us there, Ian. Let's do another analogy. Uh, I know this is something you're deeply passionate about, and it does tie back to your pharmacy roots. But orthoses, foot orthoses, as medication. So, can you unpack this concept that you've been, I know, sitting on for some time, and I think it from the outside looking in at something that you're refining your thoughts around, you know, ongoing. Indeed. It, it, it's just a model, uh, I should say, from the outset. So like all models, um, it's not perfect. And um, I, I acknowledge that. But it, it's where I'm at currently with my thoughts. And it's where I'm finding the e easiest um, belief change with people sitting in front of me, whether it be students or, or other clinicians or, or, or even runners themselves, uh, if they have a really strong belief about devices, which I feel we could probably look to break down a bit, this analogy seems to, in my experience, uh, work well. And, and as you've already said, and as I've, I've hinted at for a while, and I'm, I'm desperate to say this analogy, um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to say it. It is that uh, to, to think of orthoses as as drugs, as medication, and I just I just find myself, you know, really squeezing every ounce out of this analogy. I mean, in a, in a real world, we would love the scenario where no one needed drugs. That would be great. Um, but we also know that certain people and certain conditions require uh, intervention. That being said, no one would say that drugs are needed for everyone, that, that drugs are perfect. Uh, no one would say that drugs have no side effects. Uh, no one would say that drugs are a life sentence necessarily. It depends on the type of drug. So every kind of myth we've already touched on, hopefully, I can use this analogy to, 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 to shed some light on. So let's start with, um, let's start with the dosing of a drug. Or, or no, let's go back a step further. Let's start with how we how we make a decision that orthoses are good or bad. And I've certainly seen people make decisions based on research. So they've read a research paper that in this study of people with 
uh, whatever it may be, you know, pathology X, Achilles tendinopathy, whatever it may be, uh, orthoses were no better. You know, the, the group who were given orthoses did no better than placebo, did no better than the control group, whatever. And then I've seen people run with that conclusion and say, thus, orthoses are a waste of money, thus proving orthoses don't work. And, and to me, what you need to look at when you look at orthoses is, is that they're, they're not identical. They're like drugs. Um, if you put five pairs of, of orthoses on the table, they might look fairly similar to the eye in exactly the same way that if I put five white tablets on the table, they might look fairly similar to the eye. But what we might be looking at is five completely different drugs for completely different pathologies. And I think it's unfair to, um, to say, take enalapril, our aforementioned ACE inhibitor, to use it as the drug of choice in a study looking at the modification of blood pressure levels in, in a diabetic population. It would be unfair to do that. And it would not surprise anyone that the conclusion there would be this, this drug did not modify uh, blood glucose levels in this cohort of, of, of the population. And that would be unsurprising. What we wouldn't see is people thus saying, therefore, all drugs are rubbish. Therefore, no drugs help blood glucose. What we would say is, well, yeah, that drug wasn't fit for that purpose. And I think what we need to start doing is being much, much more um, critical of the research uh, in, in a critical in a positive way and say, OK, what device did they use? What was its shape? What was its material? Let's think of that as one drug at one certain dose. And then let's conclude that that drug at that dose didn't work for this group of people. The other thing I'll say in orthoses research is they often uh, mean pull their data, meaning when you read that there was no significant, uh, you know, mechanical change with these devices or no, or even no significant change in, in, in a pain scale, what you're often reading is, is the mean of the group response with, with, a, with a standard deviation. And that doesn't always tell the true story. It doesn't, it sometimes hides us from the really clinically meaningful stuff on, on an individual level. The, the classic old joke of, of two, uh, two hunters and a statistician, you know, going out and trying to shoot deer and, and, and the first hunter shoots and he misses five feet to the left and the second hunter shoots and misses five feet to the right and the statistician says, yes, we got it. You know, and, and we know that, that that isn't a true reflection of, of what actually happened. And um, we got to look at orthoses research as the same. And I, I think the future of orthoses research is definitely people publishing subject specific data. So instead of showing us the mean response of 30 people, I want to see how every single individual in that study responded. Um, a massive amount of extra work from a research point of view, of course, but I think you know that's the way that research needs to go. So anyway, getting getting back to our analogy, it's not fair to judge you know one drug as being good or bad, you know, based on its its application to one pathology. And we've got to think it as orthoses as, as similar. Furthermore. We've got to think about the dose. So what we know in, 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 in pharmacology is that whatever the drug of choice, if you give someone a dose that is very low, it is less likely to have any positive effect. If you give someone a dose that is very high, it is more likely to have adverse effects, toxicity, you know, re real, you know, uh, potential potentially real real fatal effects and and with any drug as it's going through its processes what they find is what they refer to as the therapeutic window or the therapeutic index which is where the the dose of the drug is high enough that hopefully elicits the the response that it's trying to but it's also low enough that it minimizes the side effects so the reason that that the maximum uh, daily dose for an adult of paracetamol is four grams is because that's what's been shown to to, to, to sit within that therapeutic window. But again, it will be it will be person specific as well. When we if we said if you said to me, you know, Ian, I've got a I've got a shocking headache, and I said, you know what you should do? You should take five grams of paracetamol. And you took it and you went, yeah, headache is still really, really, really pounding. It's not a fair conclusion that that paracetamol doesn't work for headaches. It, you know, it, the dose is far too low to have had a therapeutic effect. Um, and likewise, if you said, oh, you know, I've, I, I took 20 grams of paracetamol, you'd be talking to me from your hospital bed where you'd probably had your stomach pumped. So, again, we've got to get our dosing right. And that's the one thing in the world of, of foot orthoses that we're still is still a work in progress. How do we dose people effectively? We, I can put something in someone's shoe 
that doesn't help them but doesn't cause them harm. And that doesn't tell me whether they're a good or a bad candidate for orthoses. It tells me the dose is too low. I can put something in someone's shoe that causes you know, adverse effects, problems elsewhere in the body definitely ha can happen. And, and, and the art and the, the science and the, 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 the thing that we're constantly refining and the thing that we should be really focusing on getting good at is, is finding that middle ground. So I always say to people, even the person that comes in with nine pairs of orthoses in a, in a carrier bag, and I say, let's lay these out. Let's take a look at the drugs you've you've used. What are they? What doses were they at? Tell me what you know. What ones helped? What ones didn't? What ones were an overdose? What ones were an underdose? And maybe, just maybe, we can work out something that will work. Or perhaps you're a terrible candidate for this intervention, which is, of course, also true. It's true of drugs. Um, if we took 10 people with a headache and we gave them all the identical dose of paracetamol coming on to our subject specific response here, um, we wouldn't get 10 identical responses. We may get some kind of breakup of seven people saying, brilliant, headache is gone. Excellent. Love the drug. I'll definitely reach for it next time I have a headache. You may get two people saying, headache's still there. I'm going to need something more. Paracetamol doesn't seem to work for me. You may get that one person that has an anaphylactic reaction to it. And I think when we're looking at giving people orthoses, those potential outcomes of going well, being indifferent or going badly are still very, very likely to occur. And we should be mindful of this as clinicians, because this should colour our discussions. This should influence the discussions we have at time of issue. It should influence how we set expectation. And I think if someone realises this is a drug, I've prescribed it to you for a reason, I feel like I've prescribed the most appropriate dose, but that may need refinement based on your response. While we're talking about your response, by the way, I can't predict that, nor can anyone, but we're going to listen to it very carefully, and this thing is capable of causing problems, so listen to your own body. Um, and by the way, after all of this, we may still decide that you're a terrible candidate for this particular intervention. Um, you know, this is this is what I've basically told you is the kind of discussions I'm having every time I give someone a device. And I've definitely had people that these things haven't worked well for over the years. And they've emailed me to say thanks, you know, rather than kind of emailing me upset, emailing me, throwing throwing these devices back in my face. Um, they've they've emailed me saying thanks, because from the outset, expectations were managed. And from the outset, there was no belief that this was corrective. There was no belief that this realigned their skeleton. They very much knew what it was and what I was trying to achieve with it. And to a risk of completely milking this analogy dry, just to touch on one of the other things that we, we talked about, which is this life sentence thing. And again, I, I feel like this drug analogy works, works well here for me, at least, is that you may be given drugs as a short course. Imagine you have a chest infection, um, reasonable to be given a course of antibiotics, which you know is going to be seven days long. It's a, a short course because that's appropriate. Um, we also know that there are things that we can sometimes take on a more sort of longer, uh, medium term thing. So let's say you have an acute respiratory attack. You may well be given prednisolone for its anti-inflammatory, it's a steroid with its anti-inflammatory properties, and you, you're probably going to have to take that longer than a week. But I don't know many people that would prescribe it for the rest of your life. So more, more medium term. And then, of course, we've got the person who is who has had a, some kind of cardiovascular event, uh, say a stroke, and they are given a low dose 75 milligram aspirin for the rest of their life, one a day for the rest of your life for its antiplatelet qualities. And that very much is a life sentence. So we've got different scenarios there where a short term, a medium term or a long term um, sentence is, is, is applied. And, and that's kind of what we're saying with devices as well. There are definitely cases where these things are short term. There are probably cases where they're medium term. And although in my opinion and my experience rarer, I'm, I would not say there's never a time where they're not a life sentence. Um, and hopefully that doesn't contradict what I said earlier. Um, does that make sense? I really like it. Orthoses as drugs, the dose in, uh, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that orthoses didn't work for me because there may have been 16 ways that that orthoses could have been modified or prescribed, uh, dosed. So, Ian, I, I really like that. Thank you for elaborating on that. Ian, a few bullet points here. Prefab or off-the-shelf versus custom, as, as an experienced clinician, Yourself, uh, 
what dictates your, you know, your recommendations around those? Is it just short term you might try something off a shelf or versus longer term make something customised? Yeah, when we look at their outcomes um, within the limitations of how research on orthoses is performed, there's certainly not been anything that's dramatically shown that custom made are, are superior. Um, but like I say, you know, um, it depends how you're defining superior, of course. The reality is they're all, they're all, let's go back, let's use our drug analogy. Let's, let's, let's answer that question the way I'd answer it to a patient and we'll use our drug analogy because hopefully they'd be on board with that. Um, a prefab and, and a custom made is, 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 is essentially a drug. They're both drugs. The difference with a custom made is you have much more ability to, to control the dose, if that makes sense. Now, remember that a prefab is just a device that's made from a, a, a foot model in a factory. And what they tend to do to play it safe is they tend to use a, a, a foot shape, which would be average. And I use average in the, in the, in the, in the statistical sense. So population mean, or, or at least within one standard deviation of the mean. It wouldn't make sense to sell a, a, an orthosis on a, on a shelf or, or on the internet that was the shape of a foot that, that a, a smaller percentage of the population had. If you happen to, by chance, to have an identical foot shape-wise, to the model that they use in, in, in any given lab, you will pay some, you know, 20 pounds for something and it will fit you like a glove. It will fit you. It will conform to your shape no worse than a custom made that may cost 300 pounds would. And this is why some people say, I love super feet. I love Vasily. I don't like them. They blistered me. But what you're basically doing is you're taking something made to another foot model and how different that is to your foot model will dictate how comfortable it is. Doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean it will work or not work, but we're talking about pure comfort here. And something's got to be comfortable to stay in long enough, of course. Um, so I think when we're trying to decide in clinic, okay, we're going to go prefab or, or, or custom made, there's, there's, a, there's two considerations. The first is what am I trying to achieve? What do I think this device needs to look like to achieve that? What does this drug need to do? What, you know, what shape does it need to be? What posting does it need to have? What what stiffness characteristics does this shell need to have? And what we should all have is a really good knowledge of all of the prefabs out there uh, or the majority of the prefabs out there. And it may well be that there's a prefab out there for £20 that actually ticks all those boxes for me. And if that combined with this only needed to be a short term thing for this particular individual is the case, we will go prefab 100% of the time. If I think to tick the box, uh, to tick all the boxes design feature-wise to achieve the goal. Uh, I, if I don't think there's a prefab on the market out there that will do that, um, then we, we have the discussion about needing to go custom-made. Um, and then that's when you feed into the discussion of short-term, medium-term, long-term. And, of course, we need to be sensitive to the cost of these things as well. Uh, we need to just be transparent from, from, from the offset about this. Um, the reality is, of course, that... Uh, um, some people, if you're discussing life sentences, so to speak, if this is going to be something you might need for longer term. Um, for their durability, some people may choose to go for something more custom made because it's because it's made of superior materials. So the, the the patient, the runner, the athlete, you know, the client, whatever you want to call them, is very much a part of the decision process. Um, it's not a case of I'm the I'm the clinician and you need X or you need Y. It's a case of this is what we're trying to achieve. This is how we can potentially achieve it with all the tools available at our disposal. And let's have a talk about it. So I don't think it's as simple as saying this person or this, this, this type of person or this type of foot or this type of pathology always gets a prefab or always gets a, a custom made. It's like an N equals one context specific um, discussion, like, like, I, like, like, like I guess most things are, of course. Yeah, no, that's great. And just running with your orthoses as drugs analogy further, maybe it's like a uh, going to the compound pharmacy versus the local pharmacy for the generic drug. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and sort of, touching on some of my my thoughts that are very much in their infancy regarding psychosocial um, psychosocial considerations um, things like the color of the device things like the expectation of the device um, I think are super interesting to me and they're questions I hope to try to be able to answer um, because 
we already know from, or, or certainly my, my, my understanding from some of the research I've read around other interventions like uh, K-tape and acupuncture and um, therapeutic ultrasound, things that I know polarize opinion and can be quite emotional topics in the physiotherapy world. But I've certainly read papers where the the person's belief of that intervention going in had an influence on on the outcome. Um, you know, to, to summarize crudely, if you if you believe in something, it's more likely to work. I've also read work where the the level of education and and theatre associated with the issue of an intervention has increased positive outcomes as well. And and this is the area I think in the orthoses world that I'd like to I'd like to pick pick at a little bit more. Um, so do things that are more expensive work better? Not because not because of any other reason other than the price tag attached to them. And, uh, do you see what I mean? Like, if someone believes something might work better because it costs 10 times more, mm. does that mean it will work better? So uh, I, I don't know how we control for that. And, and, and like I say, I need to sit down and really plan this out. But I like the idea of thinking different, uh, different expectations going in, different beliefs going in, different price points, different, uh, like I touched on, different colours, uh, which, which uh, is an area that, that's sort of interesting to me as well. I think all these things, we are still in the unanswered category. And belief is so huge. It makes me think of prior uh, featured guest, uh, Matt Fitzgerald, author of How Bad Do You Want It, who surmised in one of his chapters that belief in training for athletes is as important as the training itself so this this belief is you know it's just it's huge and uh thank you for taking us there wear pattern of shoes and foot muscle strengthening very curious as a clinician myself uh, lots of runners will walk in and they'll maintain that because their foot has worn their shoe has worn here or their shoes showing evidence of this that therefore that's part of their injury causation or uh, or otherwise. Can you speak to wear patterns on shoes, please, Anne? Yeah, I, I have this chat a lot as well, as, as I know you do. And um, it, it's interesting that you you want to look for the simple. You, want, you would love to say you wear out here, and this is what I think historically has been done, you wear out here, therefore you're a pronator, or you wear out here, therefore you're a supernator. Um, if I take... Uh, someone's, you know, I, I work in the city of London and, and regardless of someone being really, you know, regardless of whatever sport they're doing, whatever injury they, they bring to the table, almost 100% of the time, gentlemen will show me their work brogues and say, oh, look, th- this is where my shoes wear out. What, what does this mean? And, and, and like I say, in the vast majority of people, it's the posterior lateral heel counter. Uh, and I say to them, that's, you know, the majority of the wear in that part of, of, a, of a shoe when you're walking doesn't occur during stance phase. It actually occurs as you gently scuff the ground when the leg's in swing phase and then at your first point of contact when you, when you heel strike when you're walking because that's usually in a slightly inverted position because of step width and, and tibial architecture. So it's far more normal or common, I think, to see wear patterns on the posterior lateral edge of the heel in, in, in your work robes, and it doesn't mean anything anything too sinister. Um, with running, I guess it's a little bit more complex because walking is always heel to toe. It's a heel to toe pattern, uh, unless it's uh, neurological, of course. Whereas running, we know. Perhaps let's not go there because it's it's a whole topic in itself. But running, there's there's, there's debate, isn't it? There's controversy. There's heel striking. There's forefoot striking. There's midfoot striking. I think when I don't read too much into, I don't read as much into shoe wear patterns as 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 many runners do if i'm honest I'll, I'll i'll always glance at them i'll also glance at the sock liner inside the shoe uh, I, I like that because i think that's uh, that it was once said to me by someone that if you if you someone brings in an old pair of shoes and they pull out if you pull out the sock liner it's basically like life's pressure mat so you know you can you can get someone on a on a bit of a, you know on a on on pressure pressure measurement uh, systems, and you can look at them there and then as a snapshot in time, or you can say, you've had these shoes for 400 kilometers, great, pull out the sock liner, and there's a nice average of, of where they spend their time. I probably look at wear patterns inside more than I do outside, and I, I tend to say to people, don't worry so much about the wear patterns being a reflection of how you're behaving mechanically. Um, 
more people than not will, will probably show somewhere on the lateral border because we tend to land slightly inverted uh, when we're running because of our running limb varus. Um, but things like I'm wearing out quicker on the left than the right, they, they could potentially be uh, answered by, by the always coming out your front door and turning right, which is, is something that, you know, a lot of, a lot of runners do. So um, I, I rightly, or, rightly or wrongly, I don't place massive emphasis on it. So that's very liberating to me, Ian. I don't feel like I've, uh, I've been practicing poorly then because I haven't either. So, so thank you. Uh, Ian, finally, foot muscle strengthening. Uh, is it a big part? I mean, I guess it comes back to it depends, N equals one. You know, you're dealing with the, the patient, the run of the athlete, the client in front of you. Uh, is it something that, you know, there seems to be a, an emerging body of research around this, uh, you know, in terms of the literature is it a big part of what you do generally day to day? Foot muscle exercise prescription? I, I do it a bit. Um, I, I don't think it's the answer to everything, as I've as I've uh, read some people read, and and I think the it's far more popular now than it was 10, 15 years ago. And, and and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's probably true that we neglected. Um, foot muscles for for a while. Um, you know, there's an incredible amount of musculature in the human foot, as you know. Not just the you know the extrinsic muscles, um, you know, in, in the lower leg, but the the intrinsic muscles. You know, three layers of muscles in the sole of the foot. They're, they're small, and therefore they have a you know they're never going to generate as much output as your quads or your or your glutes, of course. And I think um, you know if, I, I I think when we started talking more about sort of barefoot training or say we when, when, when the barefoot phenomena had another spike in around 2010 and this this topic became more more sexy to talk about um i think it was a good thing in many ways because it made people realize you know what mate maybe we shouldn't maybe we have been neglecting them i think don't swing the pendulum too far and say everyone needs stronger feet make sure you've got stronger feet etc um but but i think we need to land somewhere in the middle on that one i i, I always defer to to uh, a colleague uh, dr luke kelly who's over in, in your neck of the woods mm. um who um i recently uh spoke at a conference with in italy and we, we had a chat over this over a beer and he's he's pretty much uh did his phd in intrinsic foot muscles and he's got some some really good insight and some really good data on on whether strengthening foot muscles actually changes arch height or foot posture as, as people say. And I think people will be surprised to, to hear that it's, it's, it's nowhere near as black and white as, as they, as, as they'd like it to be. Um, on a daily basis, on a pragmatic clinical level, I've found that the time you have to put in to some of these uh, intrinsic exercises uh, for what you get out um, is, is, sort of not always balanced favorably so i i mean i always say to people and as as a as a as a masters runner myself i say masters because i know we i know when we're over 40 we're called masters in in your country we're called veterans over here and i'm, I'm not no fan of the word veteran but as a masters runner who is busy with work and and, and busy with a young family and, and and you know i'm no different to any other runner in that regard we're, we're time poor we've got to make our time count I think to myself, if I've if I've not got much time to train in the gym and be my, my running specific strength work, where do I want to place my focus? And for me, and and certainly my own interpretation of, of things currently, and from following people like yourself and other people on social media, it's you know what we should probably be focusing on soleus uh, and and on, on our glutes to name the two I guess big ones. And and for me. I would say to someone, if you've then got time to do some foot stuff as well, go for it. Absolutely. Go for your life. But but please don't neglect Soleus at the cost of picking up a pencil every night. Well said. That's uh, that's terrific. And that parallels with my current thinking uh, as well. So, that, so that's, uh, that's really reassuring. Ian, uh, just before we uh, hear from you around where we can find you and what you've got coming up, something that just sprung to mind, foot posture. I've heard of this concept, the foot posture index. What is that? Is that anything we need to be mindful of? It is something we, sh we should probably be, you know, all clinicians should be aware of, I think. Um, some people use it clinically. Uh, I personally don't. Um, what it basically is, to, to summarise it, is a, a reasonably well-validated uh, classification tool. So um, it's called the FPI-6. So there are essentially six different... Um, six different kind of observations you make 
and you, you score each one on a scale between minus two and plus two, giving you a cumulative score of somewhere between minus 12 and plus 12 on this, this, this sort of Likert scale. And, um, and then there are the, these sort of uh, determined categories that you can label someone as, as, as highly pronated, pronated, you know, uh, they use the word normal, which I, 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 I'm reticent to use myself, but you know what I mean, and, and, and then supinated and, and, uh, and highly supinated. And um, it's static. Um, it's completely freely available on the Internet. It was, uh, it was designed by uh, Professor Redmond, who at the time was certainly was at Leeds University. So it's all completely open access um, on, online. And, and when you practice it and when you're good at it, even though it sounds like a big task the way I've just described, it takes probably less than a minute. And what you end up with is a, a score somewhere between minus 12 and plus 12 for the left foot and for the right foot. I don't use it clinically myself, and I certainly um, I'm not too sure when people do use it clinically what they do with that number. Um, but one thing I will say, and the one thing I would encourage people to become familiar with it for, is that in a lot of foot research, you tend to find that they'll use it to group the cohort so if you're going to look at the intervention being a, a certain running shoe or certain orthosis, what you'll probably find is that they'll have taken a, a proxy measure of foot posture so that then when they're doing their analysis, they can say as a group, we had this response. But actually, when we look at the people who are highly pronated, as defined by the FPI, uh, they had this response compared to the highly supinated. You, you get the idea. So. I wouldn't encourage people to rush out and apply it to clinical practice, but a good awareness of it will help your uh, reading and appraisal of some of the literature published in the foot world. You're listening to Ian Griffiths on this, an expert edition of the Physica Performance Show, exploring all things foot orthoses, the facts and the fallacies. If you missed last week's episode, it was an interest edition featuring former Runner's World editor and best-selling author, Scott Douglas. We explored Scott's recent publication, Running Is My Therapy, Relieve Stress and Anxiety, Fight Depression, Ditch Bad Habits, and Live Happier. It's a must-listen for any runner or anyone that enjoys sport of any kind. Here's a little snippet of what you missed. Yeah, any run is a good run. Any run that exists is better than a run that doesn't happen. But I mean, if you're, you know, if you're biomechanically sound, yeah, any run on that day is better than not running in terms of helping your mental health. I mean, half hour to an hour is sort of like a typical average person's run. That's a good amount. To tune into the full episode featuring Scott Douglas, episode 176, jump over to iTunes or wherever it is that you enjoy your podcast from. And whilst there, peruse the archives dating right back to episode one featuring surf life-saving Ironman champion Ali Day. For now, let's jump back on this and expert edition with sports podiatrist, lower limb specialist Ian Griffiths on all things foot orthoses, facts and fallacies. And something that I feel I just need to ask you about is you referenced the colour of orthoses and how that may influence things. It just seems so bizarre, but can you speak to that in terms of what you're learning about colours? Of course. So we don't have a massive amount of um, or don't have any uh, published data on this in the orthoses world that I'm aware of. But again, coming back to my 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 farm my pharmacy uh, my my pharmacy passion. Um, it's been known for quite some time that the colour of drugs can influence people's perception of of what they're going to do. Um, so to give an example, if people see red or yellow or orange drugs, they are more likely to assume they have a stimulant effect. Uh, and likewise, if people see blue and green drugs they're more likely to assume or perceive that they have a tranquilizer, which sort of makes sense that if you were someone who needed medication for anxiety attacks and you were, you were getting kind of worked up and you opened the, the, the bottle and you took out a red, a red pill, so to speak, um, it might not give, give the right message. And I think it gives interesting meaning to the whole matrix, uh, red pill, blue pill thing as well. Um, when we look at foot orthoses, there's um, some unpublished data that I'm aware of, that I was made aware of that occurred down in Plymouth University, down in the southwest of England, which took a group of people with uh, what I think were referred to as pronation related symptoms, split them randomly into two groups and gave them all identical devices. But one group had a black top cover 
and one group had a green top cover. Interestingly, the individuals in the group that had green top covers got better more frequently um, and more quickly. And I think when we look at the perception of colour, we, we could make the case that the colour green is, is a colour of health and vitality. It's uh, the colour of you know, grass on a summer's day. It's the colour of the pharmacy logo. Uh, it's the colour of the first aid box. Whereas if we think about black, it's the colour of death, decay, the plague, you know, the skull and crossbones on a pirate ship, so to speak. Um, and I ask you that if you were in a hotel and you suddenly required the first aid box and you ran down to reception and said, oh, could I have the first aid box, please? How you would feel if they handed over a black box with a black cross on it? Uh, compared to a compared to a green one, so I don't know that we have uh, anywhere near enough um, uh, anywhere near enough data to make bold claims about this. But it does seem like an area where it's worth asking more questions, and perhaps rather than just going down the proxy green versus black, perhaps we we offer patients a swatch of colours, a rainbow of colours, and we we see if people get better when they they got to choose the colour that spoke to them the most. Um, uh, and like I say, uh, we may be completely barking up the wrong tree, but I, I don't think any of these questions are going to be, you know, asking these questions is going to be time wasted. And what colour speaks to Ian Griffiths the most? <laughs> yeah, I have thought about this, actually. And, and it's interesting that I have a favourite colour. Like if if I'm if I'm buying uh, you know clothes, I, I tend I'm a, I'm a navy blue kind of guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly out there, if I'm honest. I'm a middle-aged bald man and I, and I can't I can't pull off certain things um, but I don't know that that is the same as the color I would choose for a health intervention if that makes sense I don't know navy blue to me I, I wear it because it's dull and because it doesn't make me stand out and that's that 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 personifies me perfectly but perhaps if I want something to have if, if in my mind I want something to have a real active effect of what I put in my shoe perhaps I don't want a dull and and, and inert color um, so I need to give that some thought. <laughs> yeah, no, so interesting. Uh, I was once prescribed bright red foot orthoses and in thinking about it, I really didn't feel good putting my foot on it. It's, it's so bizarre. Like I felt like it's hot. It's going to be hot. It's a color of well, this hot heat, danger. Red is the color of, of the heat and danger, right? So, yeah, that's interesting. Ian Griffiths, you've been very generous with your time and knowledge. I'm going to ask a very difficult question, which I ask every every guest. If you could boil everything you've learned through your professional career, your own athletic endeavours, your recent love affair with running yourself, down to one piece of advice to help listeners of this show get the best out of themselves physically, what would Ian Griffith's one piece of advice be? Um, I think it's very kind for you to refer to my athletic endeavours. That is a grandiose term for what I'm actually achieving, by the way. But uh, I think my, my, my simplified bit of advice is, is, is an obvious old, old, old time one, which is you have to prepare. Whether you are running a race, whether you are preparing a presentation for a conference, it, it's all in the preparation. Um, there's a... There's a a sign on, on the study in my wall, which is a quote from an ex-American uh, president, which is, if you have six hours to chop down a tree, you should spend four hours sharpening the axe. Powerful. And Ian Griffiths, <laughs> every guest of the show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. So what is your physical challenge to the listeners going to be? So I'm fairly new to running. I, I say that I, I've only been doing it for around about 14 months. It was a, I took it up on my 40th birthday as a midlife crisis. I was always running after a ball in my in my younger years, and I've really fallen in love with it. And I'm 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 way more passionate about it than I ever expected to be. And I recently was supremely fortunate to get to run a park run with the founder of Park Run, uh, Paul Sinton Hewitt utterly lovely guy and and quite rightly uh has an obe for you know and and I, you know I, i'm, I'm going to very much push for him to have a have a have a knighthood one day um i just think park run is amazing i think it's it can be everything to everyone you can have people there who are running 15 16 minutes you can have people that are walking people that are returning from surgery you can you see families there doing it and and whilst park run certainly doesn't need my help in in spreading the word and promoting it. My physical challenge is, is is this simple. It is that wherever you live in the world, I'm pretty certain there's a park run nearby. And and my, my challenge is that this Saturday, 
whether you walk it, whether you run it, whether it's a PB, it really doesn't matter. Just just get out and do your local park run. Absolutely brilliant. And on one of the prior interest editions, we featured the founder here in Australia, the gentleman that brought it to Australia from Paul's founding in the UK, Tim Oberg. So I'd encourage encourage you to jump back and, and tune into that one. But Ian, uh, let's take that up. Park run this Saturday. Just quickly and curiously, you said you didn't expect to fall in love with it as much as you did. What do you, what have you fallen in love with about running? Yeah, I, I thought that if I wasn't chasing after a, a ball, I, I'd get bored. That's not the case. I think running has has done a couple of things for me. Firstly, it's it's really given me some some mindfulness time, which uh, it, it's wouldn't have been cool to talk about. I think uh, you know uh, historically, but but. You know, we're, we're busy people. Life is stressful. Um, taking some time to to think about nothing, or taking some time to uh, you know synthesize the day, or listen to podcasts uh, like 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 this one. I, I think that that me time is is, is increasingly important for me, and I, I hadn't valued just how how positive it would be from a mental uh, point of view, mental health point of view, um, but also physically. I, I'm 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 41 now, obviously, and I, I feel genuinely feel fitter than i've ever felt um i'm i'm i'm, I'm entering races uh I, i'm loving the challenge um i'm loving the stats i'm loving strava loving uh, loving the data try not to be a slave to it but but yeah there's really n- not much about it I'm, I'm not loving absolutely wonderful and uh, may the love affair continue ian so well done and ian you have a lot on you're a father you're as you say a clinician uh, you're a co-host of pod chat live which is a terrific clinical resource not just for clinicians but runners alike with Craig uh, from Australia as well. So where can we find you online? You're available in clinic in the UK. Can you just pop some parameters around where we can find yourself? Absolutely. So I, yeah, practicing wise, I'm in, I'm in London. Um, my, my sort of, um, I consult it within different practices, but my, my sort of the umbrella of my, my company, so to speak is sports podiatry info. Uh, so my, my website is sports podiatry info.co.uk and, and there. There's my yeah that's that's links into my blog and and the two clinics that I practice in London a Booper clinic and, and Pure Sports Medicine um, where I consult from the uh, sort of accompanying social media as we will do in in this in this era um, is is Twitter sports underscore pod uh, Instagram sports podiatry info and as you've already mentioned Pod Chat Live which is which is our little um, our little podcast that you haven't escaped our shortlist, by the way. I know I, I, I pre-warned you about this. You're, you know, we have a shortlist of future guests, so expect expect to call up. Uh, I'm, I'm really only doing this so I can call in a favour and you'll you'll do mine, if I'm honest. But um, yeah, Pod Chat Live is on all of the 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 usual uh, channels as well. So it, it's just Pod Chat Live, all one word, and that's on um, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, wherever people get their podcasts from, and it's got its own website as well. Um, and like I say, um, uh, mainly aimed at, uh, initially at least, aimed at podiatrists, completely free uh, episode CPD that we record on Facebook Live. Uh, I think we're up to episode, we're coming up to episode 60 now. So we're still a baby compared to you, of course. But, um, but, but, but I've actually had some really good feedback from from other professions as well, physiotherapy um, colleagues that, that I, I know and trust, who've said that, that they're getting value from it as well. So just, just I guess, trying to do our bit. Well, that you are. Well, Ian, Ian Griffiths, you are a foot treasure uh, in terms of what you contribute. So thank you for your contribution to this show, myself personally, uh, and beyond. We wish you all the very best. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I hope and I trust that you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, then please let Ian Griffiths know. You'll find all of Ian's handles over on pogophysio.com.au at the show notes. Alternately, you can easily find Ian over on Instagram at sportspodiatryinfo, all one word. Massive thanks to those who have been leaving ratings and reviews for the show and also for those hitting subscribe. Subscribing really is the best way to help the physical performance show grow in reach. 
Big thanks this week to show listener Mzenator103. Mzenator commented, Through listening to the show over the last few years, I've enjoyed hearing insights from some of my favourite athletes and many greats in the athletics community. I've been inspired by them and also learnt so much about what it means to run professionally. Love all the expert additions as well. They've been so helpful in understanding strength work properly and injury management. Thanks for all your work, Amy. Amy, thank you for taking the time to leave that review. They really do provide an injection of enthusiasm and encouragement, so thank you. Please keep the podsies coming. They also are a rocket fuel for the show. That's simply a screenshot of the episode that you're enjoying and tagging in the Physical Performance Show at Physical Performance Show over on Instagram and or myself at Brad underscore beer. A massive thanks as always to the good folk who make this show possible week in, week out. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer. Susan Wilkin, all things show administration. Matthew Alden, all things show graphic design. And Oliver Crossley of Pogo Physio, all things behind the scenes. Another massive shout out and thanks to this week's show sponsor, Physio Creme. Physio Creme support really does make the show possible. So be sure to jump over to physiocreme.com.au and enjoy your 20% off offering for being a listener of the show. Physio Creme is the cream of choice that we use at Pogo Physio and it is a wonderful product in helping you perform at your physical best. Thank you, Physio Creme. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we continue with the expert editions. And I'll bring you a conversation that I recently had with Dr. Trent Stellingworth. Trent Stellingworth is the Canadian Sports Institute Director of Performance Solutions. He's also the lead for Athletics Canada for Physiology Performance and Innovation. Trent Stellingworth really is a giant in all things physiology, nutrition, and fueling the athlete. Trent spent four years heading up the innovation for Power Bar and has published more than 40 peer-reviewed scientific publications. And Trent shares around such an important topic for anyone looking to perform at their physical best, particularly endurance athletes. We discuss the fueling for endurance athletes, what matters, what doesn't, some very practical tips for marathoners. And then we discuss two topics that we are yet to deep dive on with the Physical Performance Show, and that is the importance of energy availability for athletes and the consequences of what is known as relative energy deficiency for athletes. Here's a little snippet of my conversation with Trent Stellingworth, PhD. The last 10 to 20% of any endurance, prolonged endurance race over two hours or over 90 minutes can really go south if you don't fuel properly. And taking 30 seconds extra at an aid station could buy minutes, if not tens of to 20 of minutes in, in the types types of speeds and, and races he's doing. He's a, that's what he's doing. He's just making sure. In addition to a conversation around fueling and energy availability, Trent also shares some insights into what is known as body composition periodization. It is an episode not to be missed, so be sure to be tuning in next week to episode 178 of the Physical Performance Show. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.